I should start by just asking if you have any questions. Okay, so this is the the random game with death. Um, so I've got um, a binary tree with um, even depth, just to make the the problem a little bit easier, and. Down at the leaves, here are the leaves. Some of the leaves are good and some of the leaves are bad. And you uh, start by um, have you you have a, a token sitting on one of the nodes, and in a single move you can decide to move the token down into the left or down into the right. And then death says, great, my turn. And death moves the token either down to the left or down to the right. Um, now, as I said, some of the leaves are bad in the sense that if you end up there, um, death wins the game. Of course, by death winning the game, I mean you die. Um, otherwise, if you land on one of the good leaves, um, you death loses and you live forever. Um, which, if you've read uh, uh, anything involving people living forever, is you win for a while, but then you really, really lose. Okay. It's really hard to have a good time when the the sun has burned out. Forever means forever. Right. So the, the, the question is first, um, all right, so you and death alternate um, so it's a game. Uh, if you end on a white square you win. If you end on a black square you die. Um, and the question is um, to determine, given the original um, input tree as some sort of data structure, whether it's possible to win this game. Okay, so question, can you win? Okay, so um, how would you answer this question? I'm sorry? I mean, it's the same idea in the sense that you're alternating turns and you have goal, goal conditions where one of you wins and the other one doesn't. But the, 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 the Dr. River game was stated in, in, in actually quite a bit more generality. This is pretty simple. It's just a tree. It's just a binary tree. Yeah. I mean, you can do a post order reversal of this tree where you, you should pass the depth that you're at at each stage because the depth informs whose turn it is. Right? Right. And then so what you do is you check all the leaves and assume that whoever's turn it is will take the best move they possibly can. Okay. Um, and you, so if you're, if it's your turn, say, mm -hmm. if any of the leaves or the other paths result in a move that lets you win, you, you win if you reach that stage. Right, so, um, you win if there is a move to one of the children so that death starting in that position cannot win. Death wins if he can move to a position where you cannot win. So in each, at every node, what you're asking is whoever's turn it is, is there a move so that the other player cannot win? Right. Um, so if you think about this a little bit, um, you can say, I, I'm going to treat this as, um, sorry, so you think of this as um, true, 
and uh, a, a, a bad square as false. And I'm going to think of each node as an AND gate. Right. So I win if and only if um, it is not true that both of my children are winning positions. Right. If both of my children are winning positions for my opponent, then I lose. Right. So if these are both ones, that should be zero. Otherwise, this should be one. Right, so it's just a big circuit made of NAND gates. Um, and I can evaluate this by a simple post-order traversal. If the depth of the tree is, um, so I said it was even, um, then the running time of this algorithm is order 4 to the d, which is actually the same as just adding the number of nodes. Um, I double at every every level, so the number of leaves is two to the two d. Now, the second part of this question asks: um, Can you figure out whether you whether or not you win faster than four to the d? Um, and the immediate answer might be: No, of course not. You have to look at all the input. But let me imagine, for the sake of argument, that what you're given is um, and one solid block, an array, and what you're allowed to do is say, hey, is, no, is leaf number five a good node for me or a bad node for me? And in principle, you might imagine that by examining only a subset of these um, leaves, you can you know, you quickly figure out, for example, if all of the leaves on the left side of the tree are good, then your first move should be go to the left, and now it doesn't matter what happens from now on. And so you successfully avoided looking at all of the input data. Um, so the problem is um, prove you can't avoid worst, uh, this worst case. Um, I have to look at every leaf. Um, and here, um, what you need to imagine is that death cheats. Whenever you look at a note, whenever you look at a leaf for the first time, death colors it in white or black in a way that makes your algorithm, whatever it is, um, have to look at everything. Um, and the basic strategy is to turn the, the, the algorithm on its head. Um, the first time you look at a leaf, um, if you haven't seen that leaf or its, or its neighbor or its sibling yet, um, you color that node black. Uh, and if you have already looked at the sibling, then the sibling must be black. So you recurse, as far as the adversary is concerned, you recurse at the parent. Then say, well, if I haven't looked at the parent's sibling before, then I want to color this parent black which, because these are NAND gates, means I want to color this, um, this thing white. Um, and so you can describe a, a, a recursive adversary strategy that says, um, in order to figure out what color I should paint the leaf, I look up until I see an uncle that I haven't painted yet. And I, I uh, do whatever I need to choose that, the, the corresponding parent to be black, so there's some alternation there. Um, so we did something like this in the homework. But the second one is now, uh, suppose I'm allowed to randomize. Um, and the question specifically asks to find an algorithm, a randomized algorithm, that runs in C to the expected time for some constant C less than 4. Actually, it says C less than three, but that is a typo. Not sure how those fours turned into threes. Okay. Um, so what should I do? <coughs> so in the worst case, I have to look at every leaf. But um, by, by applying some randomization, um, I claim that, uh, on average, um, I can avoid looking at every leaf. 
Yeah. Okay, that's even the part B. I'm sorry? That's even the part B or C to the power N. Oh, sorry. C to the power D. You're right. Yeah. If you randomly select one of your children to look at first, right. um, it's possible that you'll find a node such that you don't need to check the other ones because it already gives you the win condition if you go down. Right, so, so um, there are some cases to think about here. But the idea is that you're going to do the, uh, the same post-order traversal, um, but I'm going to randomly choose um, the first child uh, to visit um, at every node. So at the very beginning, I will flip a coin. If it comes up heads, I'll check the left subtree before I check the right subtree. And then inside, say, the left subtree, if I flip heads, I'll flip another coin. And if it comes up heads, I'll, I'll look at the left left sub subtree. And otherwise, I'll look at the left right sub subtree. And so on, recursing all the way down. Um, if you grind through um, all the various cases, and roughly there are um, you only really have to argue about what happens two levels deep. So if you figure out the, the running time for, for this tree, the rest of it you can imagine being recursive. Um, what you'll end up with is something that says um, t to the 2d, remember 2d is the original depth, um, is only 3 times t to the 2d minus 2. Right, so um, by choosing, by following this randomized strategy, um, you can show that the expected number of grandchildren you need to look at in all possible cases is at most three. And since once you get to your grandchild, you're just doing the same, you're, you're solving exactly the same problem. You, it's your turn at the root, and it's your turn at the grandchildren. So you just recursively say, what's the expected number of leaves I need to look at when the depth is 2 minus 2? Um, and you say, well, that's the expected number I need to look at at this child, and that's the expected number I need to look at at this child, and that's the expected number I need to look at at this child, and so by linearity of expectation, you're going to get this. Um, there's also a bit of independence uh, going on in here that the, the random choices you make at the top are completely independent of the random choices you make down in these in these recursive subtrees. Um, so this ends up giving you a running time of 3 to the d. Yes, in the worst case but when I'm looking at expected running time, I actually don't care about the worst case. I, what, I, what I ask is, um, okay, there are, are potentially two to the four to the D different ways of running this algorithm because at every node, I flip a coin, heads or tails, and there are four to the D nodes. And for every one of those sets of coin flips, there's a different execution of the algorithm that's going to take place. Out of all these parallel universes, some of them the algorithm will terminate early, some of them the algorithm will terminate late. What's the average? The average is going to be less than the worst case in general. In this case, it's actually considerably less than the worst case. Yeah? Well, okay, I mean, I can, I can go through a, a particular example here. Okay, so suppose the values at the four grandchildren are 1, 1, 0, and 0. Um, that means the values at my children are 0, and then 1, and then not and, that's 1. Okay, remember, you get a 1 here unless both of your children are 1s. That's, that's the NAND rule. 
Right? You get a zero if at least one of your children is zero. I'm sorry. You get a one if at least one of your children is a zero. You get a zero if both of your children are ones. Okay? So 50% of the time I will go left. Uh, at this point, in the worst, I'll say, fine, in the worst case, I'll look at both of my grandchildren. Um, so I've looked at two grandchildren now. So 50% of the time, I look at two grandchildren, I discover that one of my children has value zero, and so I immediately know that the value of the root is one without looking at the right subtree at all. So half the time, by going left, I only need to look at two of my grandchildren. The other half of the time, fine, I look at it most four. The average is two and four is three. All right, and so real, I suppose really I should argue less than or equal to. Um, so there are, uh, I guess, up to symmetry, maybe 10 different cases that you would need to write down. If you're a little bit more careful, you could reduce down to um, four or five different cases. But at this point, you can more or less um, just say, okay, what happens uh, if they're all zeros, well, then these are going to be ones, and this is going to be zero. Um, in this case, I 50% of the time I go to the left, and now 50% of the, you know, 25% of the time I'm going to go to left, left, I'll see a zero, so immediately know that my left child is a one. Um, so. Uh, what happens here is half the time I need to look at one and half the time I need to look at two. So um, this comes out to three halves. And by exactly the same argument on the right, the expected number of children I have to look at is three halves. And so the total expected number of grandchildren I need to look at is three halves plus three halves, which is three. So the cases all kind of look different, but in the end, for every case, you're going to get either three or something smaller. Uh, so this question, do we have to go all the numerals up? Or is it just like some of the adding up that we're working? I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm not sure I understand the question. Do we have to get an exact value for that uh, combinator? Uh, no, and in fact, three is not in the exact value of the concept. By, by playing the, uh, the, the case analysis, a little bit more carefully. Um, the actual constant here is something that you would get by solving a quadratic equation. You get a more complicated recurrence than the one I've written up there that gives you a slight, that gives you a slightly lower thing. It's like 2.8 something something to the end. You just need some number less than four. Yeah. No, this is assuming that you visit the grandchildren in random order. I'm, I, I don't want to assume anything at all, which is why I have to consider all possible ways of arranging the values of the grandchildren. And in each of those different ways, my expected number of grandchildren that I visit is three or less. I'm sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Can you okay, so this is very similar to the majority tree question that we uh, we had in the homework, where um, for the majority tree question, um, I have a ternary tree, and um, the value at each node is the majority of the values in its children. And we used a very similar um, uh, a very similar analysis to the one I showed you here to show that you don't you don't actually need to look at three to the D weaves. You can get away with less. Um, and the way that analysis worked was to say, again, it's sort of a, a random, uh, post-order traversal. Um, 
now I recurse after just one level, so the only cases I have to think about are what happens when my three children all have the same value, and what happens when my three children don't all have the same value. Okay, so if my children are 0, 0, and 0, versus if my children are 0, 0, and 1, this captures also the case all three children have the value 1. This captures the case two of the children have value 1 and the other one has value 0. Is, and, and any permutation of these is equivalent as well because I'm looking at them in random order so that the existing order doesn't make any difference. In this case, if all three of my children have the same value, then as soon as I look at two children, I'm done. Because no matter which two children I look at, I'm going to see the two zeros, and then immediately I know that the, that the root has value zero. Okay? So, um, um, in this case, I only need two recursive calls. Um, and here I'm not even doing a randomized analysis. It doesn't matter what order. It doesn't matter whether the order is random or deterministic. Once I look at two children and I see that they both have value zero, that immediately tells me the root has value zero. Um, but now when two of them are the same and one of them is different, um, there are essentially three different orders that I can use. It might just by chance look at the two that are the same before I look at the one that's different. Or I might look at the majority and minority and then a majority. Or I might look at the minority element before I look at the majority elements. And these, these three cases are equally likely. Right? Um, in the first case, I, I see two zeros. And so I don't have to look at the one. I know that the majority value there is a zero. Um, so in this case, um, I only make two recursive calls. In the other two cases, I see a 0 and then I see a 1. And I haven't seen what's here yet, so I don't know whether the majority is a 0 or a 1. So I have to make the third recursive call. Right. And by um, the, the same argument, um, in the third case, I have to make three recursive calls. So um, the expected number of recursive calls is one third times two plus one third times three plus one third times three, because those three cases are equally likely, this comes out to eight thirds. Or no, sorry. Uh, yes, two plus two plus two is in fact eight. Um, and so if I if I plug this into um, the recurrence for my expected running time, it's at most. Um, eight thirds times t of d minus one. Now, um, it's possible that it's less than this because I might have got, I might get lucky, and the person who set up the tree happened to have um, three siblings that are all the same value. But I can't count on that. I can't count on that with any even with any particular probability because. I'm not assuming any randomness in the input. The randomness is entirely in the algorithm. Um, and so, because this case forces me to do more recursive calls than that one, for purposes of analysis, I have to assume that I always see two different values in my children. Um, and so I get an eight thirds here, and then this comes out to. Um, Eight thirds to the d, which is better than three to the d. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. Um, the first problem comes from the exam I had in 473 five years ago. Uh, 
somebody in the review session asked me what's going to be on the exam, and I said everything. And uh, the person who asked me that question said, will there be dancing? And I said, yes. <laughs> so um, that's why every problem has something to do with dancing. Um, so OK, so the first problem on that exam, um, uh, I'm not going to try to draw the line of people. What I'm going to draw instead um, are just you know rectangles. Okay, so you've you've got a line of people with numbers um, on their shirts, same number front and back, um, and they all start out lined up in some weird order. Um, and on cue, the director can call out um, five, say, and what will happen is the five people that are furthest to the right will all turn in a line like this. Okay. So this means two things. One is um, that the order of the people will change. I'll, 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 th those five people will now reverse their order. Um, but the other thing that will happen is that um, these people are now facing away from you instead of facing towards you. And so now I might call out three. And so seven and two are still facing forward. Five and six are still facing away. And now three, four, and one do a, 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 a rotation. And so the goal is to eventually get to um, all of the people lined up facing forward in numerical order. And I want to do this, um, at least intuitively, reasonably fast. So I want to design an algorithm which can go from whatever the initial configuration is, that's the input, to this final configuration where everything, everybody's facing forward in the right order, using as few of these flips as possible, where a flip is some number of people that includes the last, you know, contiguous set of people that includes the one on the end, um, rotate. You, you, you start from somewhere, and then everybody from that person to the end flips. Surprisingly, it's not an exam question that I'm about to tell you. About to tell you. Surprisingly, figuring out the absolute minimum number of flips that you need to undo this is not NP hard. Yeah, it looks like that. But it would be if people weren't allowed to turn their backs on you. So the problem. When you, you know, reverse your order, but everybody keep facing forward. What's the minimum number of flips that I need to, to sort that array? That's NP hard. But if I allow you to turn your back when you do the flip, then it's not. <laughs> Why? Because there's a polynomial time algorithm. Why is the other one NP hard? Because there's a polynomial time reduction from 3SAT. Um, neither of these results is is easy or trivial or obvious. It's not easy to show that the hard problem is hard, and it's not easy to show that the easy problem is easy. Um, uh, this problem has a name. This is normally known as the burned pancake sorting problem. So what you should imagine is I have a stack of n pancakes, and on every pancake, the either one one side or the other is burned, and the pancakes are all different sizes, and you want to in one move you can stick your spatula under one pancake and flip everything above the spatula over, 
And what you want, want is at the end, the pancakes are sorted from lar smallest to largest, and the burn sides are all, all pointing down so the customer doesn't complain. <laughs> um, the, some of the best results uh, for this problem, Papa Dimitri Ryu, are in a paper from, I think it was 1978, written by uh, Christos Papadimitriou when he was a professor at Harvard, and an undergraduate you may have heard of named William Gates. I like to refer to this as Bill Gates' only contribution to computer science. <laughs> um, so uh, how would you do this? How, how, how would you solve this? Yeah. You would flip it so that the smallest element you're trying to get to the beginning ends up at the end. Uh huh. And you do another flip to make sure it's facing the right way. Right. And you flip the entire thing. Okay. Like so, right. So if I if I start with you know the 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 input that I use as my example, um, the first thing I should do is figure out where number one is, I want to move number one as far to the right as possible. So um, the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to flip, starting at number one, this will put one um, at the end, uh, and all of the others will stay the same. And then I need to flip everybody so that one ends up at the beginning. Um, and now this is forward, 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 back, 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 back. Um, and then possibly I need to do one more flip because uh, maybe one is facing away from me. Oh, wait, no. That's not when I want to do the flip. When do I need to do the flip? Possibly I need to do a flip here. Remember, I'm only allowed to flip a suffix of dancers. So if I want to turn over one dancer slash pancake, I need to do it when that dancer is all the way to the right slash on the top of the pot. So if it happens that, that dancer number one is facing toward me, I tell him to turn around, that's one flip. And then I flip everybody, that puts dancer one on the left, now, facing toward me, and then I recursively sort everything else. So um, the running time is at most three plus the running time when I have only n minus one dancers. Yes? Do you have to like, flip both groups in the same before you recursively? No. My, 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 in fact, I'm solving a more general problem where I don't assume that everybody stays in front of the account. Because uh, I, I'm going to take care of that all at the end. But is that really the Sorry? Is it really this is on the exam that I gave five years ago in this class. Uh, this is problem number one. Yeah, but it's not BP. It's not no, it's an algorithm. <laughs> it's just, can you write down an algorithm? It, it, I mean, I would actually feel perfectly safe asking this question on homework zero. And that puts it in scope for midterm one, and that also puts it in scope for the final. Right. So um, what you end up with is... If you just carry this out blindly, um, you get uh, th at most three end flips. But then um, if you're a little bit more careful, you realize that um, you can do slightly better. Um, when you only have one dancer, you only need to do one flip to make sure that you, he's facing forward. You don't need to do three. Um, so the full credit answer here was three and minus two. Are we assuming that at all times you know exactly where every answer is? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
So the, the, the resource that you're measuring here as time is not actual computation time if you try to implement this on your iPhone, but rather number of flips. Random walks and random walks. I can do it if you really want to, but yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> So um, this is the dynamic programming question. Okay, so um, the problem here is you are given a four by n grid of numbers. Um, which may be positive, which may be negative, which may be zero. Um, and what you want to do is choose a subset of these numbers whose sum is as large as possible, but subject to um, a constraint that I'm not allowed to choose two numbers if they're immediately adjacent to each other. So in the example that's on the screen, if I choose the 9, I'm not allowed to choose either the 7 or the 5. Okay? So if I choose a number, I can't choose any, the, either of its immediate neighbors to the left or right, and I can't choose either of its immediate neighbors above or below. So in this example, um, I might want, for example, to choose 8, 9, 7, or 6, um, and I'm going to make this more, more interesting, you know. Okay, so in, in this case, this might be the correct answer for this, this grid that has four, three rows. Uh, but I don't know how many rows I have a priori. I, that, that's actually part of the input. Okay, so the input is an array that um, has n rows and four columns. And I want to choose uh, a subset with um, the largest possible sum, but excluding, you know, let's say forbidding um, any uh, adjacent pairs. So. Um, any ideas? Zero one zero zero or zero 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 one or zero 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 zero. Which one do we take? No, we will not take uh, <laughs> one 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 one, but we can take a zero 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 one zero one. Okay, so there there are some valid patterns that we're allowed to take. So um, the 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 possible the possible valid patterns are, you know, we can just write them down. Uh, here they are. There are eight of them, right? So uh, um, these, you know, these eight bit patterns describe the possibilities for each row. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm sorry? Well, okay. What I'm waiting for somebody to tell me is how are we going to solve the problem? You have three words. Is it maximum flow? Is it build a graph? Is it dynamic? Okay, good. So it's dynamic programming. Great. So when we do dynamic programming, what is the first step? Good. We need to design a recurrence. What is the first step of writing down the recurrence? Defining the problem. Okay, so let's define the problem before we start thinking about how to solve it. So, um, I mean, and, and there's a general rule for, for figuring out how to de define the problem. Um, let's imagine that somehow we've already made some choices about uh, how we're going to choose the elements. So, I've already decided by some magical um, process, which I don't remember, uh, that I'm going to use 13 and I'm going to use 6. And my recursive subproblem is how do I choose what's left? Everything below that blue squiggly line. Okay? But how do I describe that problem? I need to specify the input to that recursive question somehow. So what information do I need to give you to describe one of these subproblems? The line where you are and the previous pattern. Okay. So I'm going to write... Um, max sum of i and let's say b. This is the um, maximum sum from rows i through n where row i minus 1 uses bit pattern B. So in particular, I don't, when I'm thinking about what to do on row 3, I don't care what I did on row 1. I only care about what I chose to do on row 2. Alright, so this particular thing would be um, max sum of 3 and 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay? Good. Now we need to write down a recurrence. Um, do you have any reasonable base cases? Easy. Trivial. If i is bigger than n, we don't have any rows of the matrix left. We've fallen off the bottom. So the answer is zero. Okay. Otherwise, what do we do? Right, so for every possible candidate for row i, I add the numbers in those corresponding positions, and then I make the recursive call based on that bit pattern. Okay, I just have to write that down somehow. Um, so let's say this is the max over all B prime uh, consistent with B. B of uh, the sum over from, say, J equals 1 to 4 of B prime sub J times A of I J plus max sum of I plus one B prime. Now, uh, you could, if you wanted to, write down what um, this word consistent means, but at this point I'm willing to say, oh, okay, fine. Uh, it means B prime bitwise and B is equal to zero. But it's four bits and four bits, it's some constant time thing, so whatever, I don't care. Okay? 
Um, what's the initial call? So the initial call starts with the name of the function. <laughs> All right, one and then a bunch of zeros. So start at row one, and I haven't chosen anything in row zero um, because there wasn't anything to choose. Uh, how do I memoize this? Sorry, I should uh, I should follow my own advice here and uh, switch to a different color, put on a different hat, get up and go to the bathroom. Once I've figured out what the recurrence is, then in fact, I, I really don't care what it means, um, um, except to understand what the types of variables are. So how am I gonna memoize this function? Yeah, this is uh, you know an n by 16 array. Um, okay, if I want to be clever, I really only need to keep eight here because there are only eight valid bit patterns, but whatever. Um, the right answer is um, n by some constant array. Uh, great, so this is a one-dimensional array. What did we go? Um, what order do I need to evaluate the array in? Because max sum of i depends on max sum of i plus 1. And, and what's the running time of the algorithm? Sorry? Linear. Because for each index i, I have some constant number of subproblems to consider. And for each of those subproblems, I have this some constant number of things to look up and add together and multiply and compare. Yeah? Um, would this be possible to do as a maximum flow algorithm? I don't want to say it's impossible, but I don't see an easy way to do it. Um, I mean, I could imagine something where you might be sending flow from the bottom of the, the array to the top, and you're going through some gadgets established, you know, established at every array entry, um, and the gadgets are connected in, up in a way that, that, that um, uh, avoids these forbidden adjacent pairs, and you want to compute some maximum cost thing. Um, my guess is that you would wind up with something like n cubed or n to the fourth is the running time. So it's a lot of work for a not very good algorithm, if it works at all. So no. If you correctly solve the problem with maximum flows, um, I think it depends on what the running time is. Suppose it's not over. No, let's say if you could do it in n squared, that'd be worth seven points. If you could do it in L cubed, that would be worth five points. All right. <laughs> if you have a correct algorithm, it will be worth three points because correct algorithm is worth more than I don't know. But uh, you know, so doing something really complicated like that, it, there's a lot of opens up a lot of uh, opportunities to make mistakes. Yeah. So the, the the big thing that you should see when you look at this is, oh, up to big O, that's a one-dimensional array. Yeah, four and some bit patterns and whatever, but whatever, that's all constant. It's a one-dimensional array. Yeah, so if your answer was try every combination of valid numbers, would you get the answer to that? No, because you have to tell me how to do that. <laughs> if I mean if you if you actually described a correct backtracking algorithm, that would be this. <laughs> and then uh, 
Um, if you actually wrote it in this form, then you're most of the way to the dynamic programming solution. You'd actually get six points. If you wrote everything that's on the screen right now, that would be worth six points. Yes, because you've done 60% of the work for dynamic programming algorithm. Sorry? The stuff in red. <laughs> the part where you make it dynamic programming. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you just say try all possibilities and take the best one, uh, no, that, that's not going to be worth really anything. Um, you actually have to describe it in a way that I have some hope of implementing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions about this one? Okay, so this one is a, um, a graph modeling question similar in some ways to the Fillory question on midterm two. Um, ultimately, this is going to boil down to computing um, a shortest path in a graph, but you have to define the graph properly. Um, and we haven't done a lot of shortest path stuff, but you know, still the, the idea of constructing the graph is, is useful. Okay, so um, the idea is um, you want to take the bus home from uh, from from uh, you know Siebel, um, and what you're given is a list of um, bus routes. Which uh, is tells you for each bus when that bus, the, the sequence of stops that the bus is going to visit and the time that that bus will visit that stop. And the same bus might visit the same stop multiple times. That's okay. Um, uh, right. So imagine there's one stop. Um, at Siebel, you know, right out there, um, and there's another stop, you know, uh, just outside your front door. And what you would like to do, because it is raining, is you want to spend the least amount of time outside waiting for the bus as possible. I don't remember if this is the exact question that the, the problem asks, but the spirit of the thing is the same. All right. All right. So you want to minimize time uh, waiting for buses, you know, outside in the rain. So um, uh, you can imagine that you can time your exit from Siebel so that you don't have to wait for the bus. You walk out of Siebel at exactly the right time to catch the bus when it visits that stop. Um, then that bus maybe goes to the Union and you get off and you wait three minutes for another bus which takes you down to Lincoln Square Mall and you get off that bus and you pick up another one that takes you to wherever you live. Okay. Um, uh, but the time in between uh, leaving Siebel and arriving at home, if you're not on a bus, you're out in the rain getting cold and wet. So you want to minimize that time. Time. I want spending 7.2 minutes in the rain is better than spending 7.4 minutes in the rain. Okay. So the question is, um, how, given that input, construct, you know, figure out which buses to take when, so that you spend the least amount of time in the rain, and you successfully get home. What nodes? Okay, so um, build a graph where um, the vertices are um, stops uh, are all you know these are the set of of pairs 
stop time where some bus stops at that stop at that time. All right. So I will endow you with the magical ability if there are two buses at the same stop to go from one to the other without getting wet. Okay. Um, and now um, I need um, edges. Um, so what are the edges in this graph? Okay. All of the same stops uh, of different times. Okay, so you've got edges where you're waiting in the rain. This is um, stop uh, time one to stop time two uh, for all, well, actually, you know, so the idea is you sort the times that some bus stops at a particular location and you connect all those up in a single line. Um, so here's um, a single stop. And then for another one, it might look like this. Okay, um, but then I have um, other so other edges. Right. So right. So this is um, stop one. Uh, time one to stop to time two uh, consecutive consecutive on some bus route. So there might be a bus that leaves Siebel and goes like this, and there might be another one that goes like this. Uh, there might be another one that goes really fast. Um, buses don't necessarily uh, have to make sense. Um, the bus might take winding roads and the other bus goes down a fast road. That's fine. Okay. Um, now, um, now what do I want to do? You want to assign the weights. Okay, good. I need to assign weights to the edges. What are the weights going to be? If for all the ones where you're riding the bus, it's zero. Okay, so zero if E is on a bus. And then it's equal to the time when it's that side of um, Actually, zero if uh, stop is Siebel or home. There's no point in getting off the bus at home and then standing in the rain until another bus goes by. So, um, otherwise, it's uh, time two minus time one. Okay. Um, and now, what problem do I need to solve? Shortest path, right? From what to what? Siebel at time, whatever the minimum time is for Siebel. Right. Or maybe I can just add another node that means now. Right. Um, to uh, home, uh, and again, you know, eventually I get home. Yeah. Dinner. <coughs> or uh, sleep. You know. Um, so you might want to adjust the, the vertices to add these artificial nodes, all right? Um, and if I'm really being anal about this, you probably want to um, exclude any time that is after now. But um, it doesn't really help you all that much. Um, okay, so great. What algorithm am I going to use to solve this problem?
How do you compute shortest paths? Good, thank you. Um, Dijkstra's algorithm runs in time uh, approximately um, e log v. Um, okay, so I need to rephrase this in terms of the, the parameters of my original input. So remember what I'm originally given is um, this list of bus routes where um, I'm told where each bus stops and when in order along the route. Um, so um, this list has, let's say, we'll, we'll call this length n. Um, I need my running time to be written in terms of, of n. I'm sorry? N is the length of the input. So what is what n? One, one element in this input is bus number five stops at Siebel at 7.29 in the evening. When I, when I generally, when I give you a list of giraffes, each giraffe I count as a unit. I'm sorry? Is what what? Well, yeah. So um, the number of vertices is n. Actually, it might be less than n because it's possible that more than one bus stops at the same place at the same time. But you know, n is an upper bound. Um, how about the number of edges? Well, let's think about this. Um, in two different ways. How many edges are, are there of type one? How many edges are there where I'm just standing there at the bus stop getting wet? At most n, because for every vertex, how many edges of this type leave that vertex? At most one. Right. How many edges are there of type two? Well, no, I mean, these are supposed to only be between consecutive things. So also n. Because after bus 1 stops here and then it goes to there, that's a single edge. So every edge consumes one of the stops in the list. Um, so uh, the number of edges is at most um, 2n. And so this is um, n log n. Now, I mean, there are versions of this that you can, you, you can change it around. You can say, I really don't like buses, so I want to minimize the amount of time I spend on a bus. So you switch up the weights. Um, I really don't like standing up, so I want to minimize the number of times I get on or off a bus. Number, minimize the number of transfers. Or uh, I actually really like buses, so I want to maximize the amount of time. Um, uh, you know, subject to the constraint that I get home as early as possible. So once I figured out the time when I'm going to arrive home, I can then reweight the edges and then look for the longest path using a different set of weights, which I can do in linear time by dynamic programming. So the the other way I could have done this is, hey, wait, this graph is a DAG. So uh, uh, I can actually compute shortest paths in, uh, in, in linear time, um, um, in this case, by uh, basically looking at the DAG in, in reverse topological order. Shortest, longest, whatever, doesn't matter. OK? All right. I need to pause for one second because I want to save this video. Oh.